Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, one thing science deniers of the flat earth variety like to talk about is gas pressure without a container. They seem to think that the Earth's atmosphere is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics if there was an atmosphere next to the vacuum of space without an intervening container. So today, we're going to talk about gas pressure without a container. So, let's cue up the music and talk about gas pressure without a container. Now before we get started, we need to do a little bit of physics to understand how gases work. First of all, the Earth's atmosphere is not an ideal gas. An ideal gas does not exist. It's an approximation of reality. Because the Earth's atmosphere consists of particles that have volume and mass and have elastic collisions. Second of all, the atmosphere itself is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. One of the concepts that they fail to realize is that a vacuum chamber on Earth is an example of the effect of work on entropy. Well, a vacuum chamber starts basically as a sealed container. You hook a pump up to it, and by performing work on the gas in that chamber, you literally move the gas from the chamber outside, creating an area of lower pressure. And finally, the atmosphere can be modeled as a fluid which is why we talk about jet streams, for example. Hey, let's do a basic physics exercise. Here, I have a glass full of liquid. Here, I have a clear plastic tube. I'm going to use this as a straw. Now, if I place the tube in the fluid and then put the tube in my mouth and lower the pressure, what happens? Fluid comes up the tube. Now, I've asked flat earthers this quite a few times and they don't seem to understand the concept behind it. Is that fluid being pushed up the straw or being pulled up the straw when I apply a vacuum with my mouth? The answer is it's being pushed up the straw because there's atmospheric pressure on this liquid. Now when I put the straw in, the surface of the fluid is at one atmosphere and the open end of the tube is also at one atmosphere. When I put it in my mouth and lower the pressure in my mouth, I decrease the pressure on this side of the tube below atmospheric pressure, and as a result, the weight of the atmosphere pressing on the coffee forces the coffee up the tube. But one interesting question is, with a short tube that's maybe five inches long, that's not a problem. What if I use a much longer tube? Is there a maximum distance that if I create a vacuum on one end of the tube that I can draw the fluid up? It turns out there is. Now for water, that's about 10 and a half meters or about 34 feet. Why is that? Well, water has mass. So even if you create a vacuum at the top of the tube, the atmospheric pressure has to push that fluid up the tube. And opposing that, is the weight of the fluid caused by the acceleration of gravity acting on the mass of the fluid. So the pressure of the fluid is trying to push it up into the vacuum, and the mass of the fluid is trying to pull it away from the vacuum. There's a balance point. Now we developed an instrument a couple of hundred years ago that takes advantage of this principle to tell us something about our environment. Let's have a look at that. Now this is a schematic of a device that we used to make in school before they decided it was hazardous to expose school children to mercury. You take a rigid glass tube that is sealed on one end and you fill it with mercury. And then you put the open end of the tube under a pool of mercury and lift the tube up vertically. As a result of that, the force of gravity pulling the mercury down will create a vacuum at the top of the tube and the pressure of the atmosphere on the pool of mercury on the open end acts to force that mercury up the tube into the vacuum. However, there's a balance point between the force of the atmosphere pushing the mercury up the tube and the force of gravity pulling it down. 
And as a result, you get a column of mercury with a small vacuum above it. Now, this instrument is called a mercury barometer, and it is used to measure atmospheric pressure. So if you take the cross-section of the tube and the height of the mercury column, you can get an idea of the mass of the mercury that is above the surface of the pool. You can use that times the acceleration of gravity to come up with the force that the atmosphere is exerting on the column of mercury to push it up the tube because it just balances the force of gravity trying to pull it down. Now standard atmospheric pressure at sea level will force that column of mercury up 760 millimeters. Or for those of us in America that like our freedom units, that's 29.92 inches of mercury. If we take this entire apparatus and move it to the top of a mountain, atmospheric pressure at that level will be lower, and the column of mercury will correspondingly be lower as well. Now let's toss in an interesting aside, and that is the difference between percentage of oxygen and partial pressure of oxygen. Now at sea level, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, or, or 760 torr. Of that, 21%, or 160 millimeters, is the portion of the atmosphere that consists of oxygen. However, certain things like combustion or fire rely on the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, a fire on a ship is a very dangerous thing because you're out in the middle of nowhere. But a fire on a submarine is even worse because it may be 15 or 20 minutes before you can even ascend to the surface to begin launching lifeboats. So one of the ways they prevent fire in submarines is they pressurize the submarine. So say you pressurize a submarine to 1,000 millimeters of mercury. I'm just tossing this out. So long as at least 160 millimeters of that is oxygen, we can breathe. However, that drops the overall percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere to the point that it's very difficult to light a cigarette on a submarine. I recently discovered I'm a much better doctor than I am a plumber because my hot water heater went out. And I was rather perplexed by it because I could get the pilot light to work and there was gas flowing to the water heater, but the burners would not light. You know, a call to a friend of mine that's a plumber and $85 later, I found out what happened. The filter to the gas burner was clogged. And as a result, there was enough airflow coming in through that dirty filter to support the pilot light. But there was not enough air coming in to support the combustion of the burners. And as a result, the burners would not light. We vacuumed out the filter, got some airflow again, I have hot water. Now another way that you can take advantage of this concept of partial pressure is in space travel. Now as Mark Sargent likes to talk about, astronauts wear astronaut suits while on spacewalks. And these are non-expanding fabric suits that are pressurized with gas. And his thought is that if you pressurize this up to 760 millimeters of mercury, the suit will be so stiff that astronauts won't be able to use their fingers or their arms. Well, be that as it may, you don't have to do that. So long as the astronauts are breathing at least 160 millimeters of oxygen, you can actually lower the pressure in the suit down to five or six pounds per square inch, but increase the percentage of oxygen. So not only do you have your suit being a little bit more flexible, you aren't carrying large amounts of inert gas into orbit. Now let's just get back on topic. One atmosphere of pressure will drive that mercury 760 millimeters up into a vacuum tube. Now the same principle occurs when the fluid is water. Now with water being less dense than mercury, water will go up approximately 33 or 34 feet, a little over 10, 10 and a half meters. So even if you have a perfect vacuum at the top of that pipe, you can't draw water up more than 33 or 34 feet. Now, the same principle occurs with gases that act like fluids, such as the gases in our atmosphere. So if we have a vacuum tube that is sealed on one end and open on the other end, and we put that open end at sea level, how high will the air go into the tube, into the vacuum? Well, as it turns out, 
like mercury and like water, air itself has mass that's acted upon by gravity. So as one atmosphere of pressure drives the air up the vacuum tube, the force of gravity is pulling down on the mass of the air. And as a result, instead of being at 760 millimeters, like mercury, or about 10 and a half meters, like water, the air column will go up to about 100 kilometers. And one atmosphere of pressure cannot push it up any higher. We have one atmosphere of pressure at sea level. As we get higher, that pressure begins to decrease until it gets up to about 100 kilometers where it drops off to zero and meets the vacuum of space. And as a result, we don't need a container for our atmosphere. And that is borne out by the many times that we have launched rockets from sea level into space, most recently the Artemis mission. Now in our next episode, I want to talk about the Artemis mission because that destroys a number of flat earth and science denial arguments. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. If you have a moment, look down in the description and you'll see the PayPal for donations to our observatory dome, which I would like to put in this spring. If you would like to support my astronomy channel and the live streams of the telescope, toss a couple bucks my way. It's about a $4,000 investment. I'm putting a lot into it myself, but if you would like to contribute, it would be much appreciated. Bye-bye, the science guy.